just make sure I can work all the things. Well, obviously, my forward button, I didn't press it hard enough, so <laughs> I'll start. Now, many of you may have been disappointed if you looked at the provisional programme when you came in. Um, we were hoping that Claire Crawley, who's the Senior Policy Manager for an Adult Safeguarding at the Department of Health, was going to be with us today, but unfortunately she can't. Um, and she does offer a profuse apologies, um, but she has, however, contributed to this presentation, and I've got some direct quotes in there um, from her. So she'll be here with us in spirit, and she'd be quite happy if anybody wants to um, contribute anything to the work that we're doing. Now, I stand before you this morning to tell you briefly about some of the work that has been done by the Tissue Viability Society in relation to pressure ulcers and safeguarding. You know, I must acknowledge um, that this work is directly relevant to England and not necessarily Wales and um, Scotland or Northern Ireland um, to do that. But again, we're always sharing work, so that's um, very valuable to us all. However, you know, I think that we would all recognise that safeguarding is probably an international issue. We recognise that pressure ulcers are one of the many safeguarding issues in relation to tissue viability. Area of concern are avoidable skin damage to patients caused by healthcare professionals, paid and unpaid carers. For example, severe excoriation caused by the non... Oh, has that moved on? It's doing its own thing. I'm still on the first slide. <laughs> I don't quite know how that was all going on. Uh, I should be watching what I'm doing there. No, anyway. so, so some of the um, areas of concern are things like severe escoriation caused by the non or infrequent removal of incontinence pads, um, skin damage caused by um, leg ulcer bandaging um, by incompetent practitioners, um, and burned. So there are many um, areas of safeguarding and tissue viability. So I'm worried now that the slides are going to be start rushing away um, to do that. Now, obviously, you're going to look at that picture up there and think she's talking about pressure ulcers, and that's not a pressure ulcer. But actually, that's just to remind me um, to let you all know that the work that we've been doing is relation to pressure ulcers only. And it's very, very tempting, and we find that those people involved in the work are very, very tempted to slip in moisture lesions and other things. But we are trying to get, um, you know, a, a work related to pressure ulcers. Now, all healthcare professionals have a professional and moral and statutory duty to protect those we care for from harm. And there are a number of parliamentary acts that are relevant to the sphere of safeguarding. And these, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the names of, if not the entire contents. The Care Act of 2014, Mental Capacity Act, and the Human um, Rights Act. Now, many of you will have known those. It's like going to health and safety lecture, really. You go along and they say, well, when was the Health and Safety of Act work done, and things like that. But it's actually, we don't always know the contents of it um, in any great detail. And I have to say that most of my tissue viability colleagues that have been involved in this work so far, it is absolutely not our um, area of expertise. But lucky for us, there are other people involved in the work that are much more knowledgeable about that, and so make sure that we keep on track and that it all fits in nicely to do that. Now, I'm in the habit of using SBAR as a framework um, in, and for communication and communication tools, so I've actually done my, president, my presentation um, based, uh, based on this. So I'll start off with what, where we were at for this work and what the current situation was. As I say, all nurses have, um, a, have a statutory duty to protect our patients to do that. However, the lead authority um, in the investigations of pressure ulcers and safeguarding is actually social services. Um, and they would acknowledge that their knowledge of clinical issues is not uh, how pressure ulcers are caused and whether they're avoidable and non-avoidable um, is not great. So um, they are um, professionally concerned that sometimes perhaps they're being asked to make decisions about things that they are not um, the expert at to do that. Oh, it's marching its way forward again, sorry, um, to do that. Now, here I have a quote directly from um, Claire Crawley. Um, and, you know, at the beginning of this work, um, which, which started off when we were actually at a conference somewhere talking about safeguarding, and lots of issues about pressure ulcers came up. And she was like, well, I really don't know what the problem is. Why, 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 are, why are we all so concerned about this, this particular issue? 
And she said, really, at that time, she saw pressure ulcer referrals as a blockage in the safeguarding system. You know, what was happening was there were lots of duplicate reporting of pressure ulcers from health, from social services. They were all getting put into this big pot for investigation. And there were just so many, so many pressure ulcers being reported into the system that actually it was, it was not possible to actually see the wood for the trees. And people that were being reported as real major safeguarding issues were being lost in all this paperwork and all these things to do that. So, you know, when um, some areas were reporting absolutely every pressure ulcer that was seen through the safeguarding route, um, you know, a patient would come into hospital and the hospital would report every single pressure ulcer, even though that patient had actually left that hospital with a pressure ulcer previously and now come back in. But now they're reporting it because somebody new has seen it again. And it was just really, and I'm sure some of you will recognise the situations in your areas, but it was actually coming quite critical in some areas. And, you know, there was a real danger that people were going to really be harmed, not necessarily with pressure ulcers, but with other safeguarding issues because everybody was like being too involved in that. So, as I say, Claire, Claire saw that we were being overwhelmed with the system and felt that perhaps... Um, we should not be reporting pressure ulcers. In fact, actually, she stood up at this conference to start off with and actually said, um, well, actually, I don't think pressure ulcers, they're a clinical issue. They shouldn't be reported as safeguarding at all. And of course, you know, there were a lot of other people thinking um, slightly differently to do that. But that was, that was the way it was at, um, at the start of our work. Now, we have some issues with this work that we've been doing. Now, you may um, have noted that, you know, when I talked earlier, I mentioned about raising concerns. Now, if we want to raise a concern about pressure ulcers, that's the terminology um, that is used mainly by social services. Because sometimes we raise concerns and sometimes we raise an alert. And sometimes what, um, in particular in health, we do is we have a concern, we, we investigate the concern, and then we report it as an alert, a safeguarding alert. Yeah, to do that? Now, in social services, they see as raising a concern is actually that alert. So when we say raising alert, they say, well, what are you talking about? You know, because that's not the terminology used. And that when you're trying to do some joint working, trying to get the language right so that we all believe we're doing the right thing. Words are very, very important, aren't they? We all act on words. And, um, you know, I know that there's been some issues elsewhere where they've caused, an caused um, another reporting system is called Safeguard. So people have been reporting things on Safeguard, which is you know, a computer system, thinking that that means that they've reported it to Safeguarding because it's still got that one word that goes along with that. So it can be very, very confusing for people. So one of the major issues we have got is about terminology so that we actually, when we implement uh, uh, some guidance at the end of this, we all know what we're actually talking about. Do that Because as I say, when we're working in multi-agencies, sometimes we actually um, find that the words that we're using are, are not necessarily the same ones to do that. Oh. We recognised that there was an issue, and um, we, we looked at the background, what had gone on before. Now, actually, there were some areas of the country where they had got really good um, work, multidisciplinary working, multi-agency working, um, but they were in, were in pockets across the country. Um, and, you know, what we did was we, we looked to see what everybody was really up to. What are the issues? What is out there to do that? We found huge variations in standards. Our, our, our members, the Tissue of Our Medicine Society members, were saying, look, you know, there are real issues here. You know, we're, we're, you know, and across the border, they're not doing this. And across that trust over there, they're doing something totally different. So we all knew that there were some issues that we needed to do. So we had many interested parties. And some of those were at that initial meeting um, with Claire. And um, there were people there from the CQC and the Department of Health and NHS England. Um, and it became apparent that really we needed to all do at quite a high level something because individuals trying to do something in their individual trust wasn't really, wasn't really getting what, what we needed. And there was a lot of misunderstanding and misapprehension out there. So the interested parties, Claire agreed to bring forward to a meeting so that we could actually all get together and start talking about our, our myths and, um, and things that were out there. 
So as part of the work that the Tissue Viability Society have now got involved with, we are working with um, obviously Claire from the Department of Health, we've got people from the Care Quality Commission, NHS England, um, and the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, so at quite senior level, and also Health Education England, because it was recognised very early on that actually a lot of these issues are around education and knowledge um, to do that. Um, and so we feel quite um, pleased, really, that Health Education England are involved um, and are therefore able to help us, not just with, um, obviously, the safeguarding issue, but pressure ulcers and wounds um, in general. You know, trying to, get, trying to get in there, I think, is, is what we like to do, to do that. So when, we, when we've looked at where we were involved, we actually asked all those organisations to actually go out and collect information about what they were doing. So we asked a huge number of organisations um, and um, we, we put out, as a TVS, we put out on, on our, one of our newsletters if anybody's got anything they want to send to us and things like that. And as you can see before you, um, we have had, you know, we've got two pages of names. We've had loads of organisations that have actually sent us their protocols, their policies, guidance. Some people had a single A4 sheet about pressure ulcers and whether we report them to safeguarding. Other people had 65 page documents um, to read. Some people gave you all sorts of information about what the Health Act said um, so that it was really very clear, you know, but actually not, not actually how to do that. So what we did was we thought, well, we needed to review all those. Um, and because um, time and things like that, we thought, well, what we'll do is we'll just look through them all, find the best one, really, um, that everyone can agree to, and, and we'll start working with that. But, of course, once we started working with that, that's when we really identified that there were issues um, and some of, the some of the good documents were very, very health-related or very, very social service-related, and actually what we needed is something to bring the two to two things together. So what we did um, as um, an organisation is that um, three of our trustees, and um, they were Heidi Guy, um, our chairperson, and um, Fran Spratt and Julie Sturgis went through all these documents. It did take them a little while um, to try and pull together a draft. Um, but we were all from health, and that made it quite interesting, because, of course, once we sent it out to all the other organisations, they made us very aware that actually things that we think of as normal things that we talk about, do you know what I mean, um, really, really didn't make a lot of sense to some of these other people in the other organisations. So it's taken us a little bit longer than we, we initially thought, um, you know, to do this work. But I think it's very valuable, and if we can so actually try and get that, that language so that we can all speak together, I think it will be very good. So what we've done so far, um, and we had hoped when we started this work, that, oh yes, we'll pull that together and it will be ready to actually say to you, here's the final thing, take it away, read it, implement it, um, and things like that. But we're not quite that far down the line. Um, with it at the moment, as I said, for, for all those issues. But what we want to do, and what the plan is, is that we actually have some national guidance about which, which pressure ulcers should be referred to safeguarding. Now, when we looked through all the documents and all the documentation and things to do that, we thought, oh, God, some people have got these decision-making tools that will help them to decide whether, you know, some people have decision-making tools with scoring systems and things like that. We love scoring systems, don't we, because we want the we want the scoring system to tell us what to do, don't we? Yeah, because that's like really good. Um, but of course, actually, there is no such thing as one tool that's going to catch all and catch everything. And clinical judgment is always, always going to be something that's going to be needed. And I think we actually all have to consider that there will see sometimes when we're taking a risk, you know, because we could be totally risk-free and report every single pressure ulcer to social services for investigation. But that's creating a huge risk for some patients, isn't it? Um, and there'll be some patients that you'll think to yourself, you'll do, it, you'll do your investigation and you'll think to yourself, you know, actually, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm definitely this way or I'm definitely that way. And there'll be some that you'll think to yourself, well, I thought that was going to be okay, and it's not. And I think we have to be prepared for that. There is going to be no guidance and no tool that is exactly right in every single circumstance. And I think that we need to acknowledge that clinical judgment 
is always going to come in there somewhere um, to do that. I've, I've written a load of notes for myself, and I, I've never done that before, and actually I've totally lost where I am with them, so I'm going to take a little more <laughs> and carry on to do that. Now, there have been several benefits so far to the work that we've done here is that, as I say, what we want to do is we want to have this national guidance that will guide and not actually tell everybody what to do and things like that. But actually just working together with these other groups of, of people at this other level talking about pressure ulcers has had huge benefits already to us because those people in quite high places, I have to say, and not the sort of people I bump into necessarily in the supermarket, but they've actually learned and have a greater understanding about pressure ulcers. As I say, we do have those issues about wanting to bring in all the other tissue viability issues as well. But even if we can just reassure ourselves that actually people are more acknowledging that some of the things that they find out about pressure ulcers, 95% of pressure ulcers are avoidable, aren't they? You know? And um, you know, though that information is out there all over the place. And actually, people believe those things that they're written. If they see it written down, and if they see it written down even in an advert, do you know what I mean? Then they're going to be thinking that that's the absolute truth. And, and you know, we've been able to open people's eyes and enlighten them. Now, here actually are some quotes taken from, from Claire Crawley about the benefits that she's found. Um, for that. She said that when she came into contact with the Tissue Viability Society and nurses specialising in the area, she became even more concerned about some areas of, of practice. But actually, she felt quite enlightened about some of the myths that had grown up around pressure ulcers um, to do that. But other issues have actually come out of that, and some things, some issues that I hadn't necessarily acknowledged for myself. Um, but in some areas, they were wanting to photograph patients, all patients that are like transferred from a care home into, into, um, into a hospital setting as proof and evidence that when they left them, they didn't have a pressure ulcer. You know, and actually, with some of those things, we actually have to question ourselves, really. Are we doing that for the patient's benefit, you know, or are we doing it to protect ourselves to do that? And how humiliating is it to have photographs taken of you just on to be on the safe side so that you can say it was them that was causing the problem. And of course, you'll all recognize the issues of the adversarial nature, as Claire would put it, um, of some organizations rather than actually collaborative working um, to do that. Actually, in some of the policies and protocols that we came across, you know, actually that, that, that was almost in some of those documents um, about actually how, how, almost how can we evidence it was their fault and not ours. Um, and being protectionism rather than actually thinking of the patient a, a, as a whole um, to do that. Now, we are obviously not as far along in the journey of, our, our, of getting that guidance out there and things like that, but I think it's more important that we actually get it right. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and um, in the words of Bob the Builder, working together, we can get the job done. Collaborative working. Thank you.